Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I know some people are still trickling in and we have people also as always at these forums joining us via Zoom. So welcome to all of you who are joining us via, via the web. Um, my name is Joe Ferrara and uh, I'm Vice President, Chief of Staff in the President's Office. Um, and along with David Rubenstein, I've been serving for the last few months uh, as uh, co-interim Chief Operating Officer and uh, happy to be here uh, for today's forum. Um, <clears throat> before we get started, what I wanted to do was uh, recognize uh, our staff AAP Council. And of course, that's the council that really shapes the agenda and does the work uh, that leads up to these, these community forums. Uh, we're very appreciative of their leadership. What I wanna do is I'm going to just name uh, the folks who are the new council officers for this coming year. Um, and then maybe we can give them a round of applause. Some of them are, are here. I know some of them are not here, but I would like to recognize them publicly uh, by reading their names and then we can we can give them a round of applause for their leadership. So from the Law Center, our new council officers include Linda Sanders. There's Linda, Linda is here. Uh, Ruby Sheik, Jennifer Van Buren. Okay, those are our Law Center officers. Main campus, Tammy Copley Similton. Heather Malnerich. Megan Dimsa. Sonia Jacobson, Sonia is here, and Maria Snyder. From the Medical Center, Aida Chavalich, Chika Chuku, she's here, thank you, and Aaron Wilhelm. And then finally from University Services, Linda Buckley, Raja Pimarogo, here, and Desiree Roberts, who's also here. And finally, re-elected members, Karen Howenstein, Jesse Mandel, and Sandy Wilhelm. Sandy is here in the back. Thank you all for your leadership, really appreciate it. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I wanna start off with a couple of uh, acknowledgements and then I'm gonna review the agenda the, and I'll, I'll be the first item on the agenda. I'll, I'm gonna walk through some updates on our work on deferred action on childhood arrivals. Um, before I get to all that, I first wanna start by acknowledging Brenda Malone, who's not here today. Uh, you have probably seen the announcement by now. Brenda, who has served ably as our Vice President for Human Resources over these last several years, is going to be stepping down at the end of this month, and she is going to be moving over to the Smithsonian <coughs> Institution where she will be uh, directing human resources for the Smithsonian. I did have an opportunity to talk to David Scorton, who is the secretary of the Smithsonian. Uh, he's also a, a distinguished visiting faculty member here at uh, Georgetown. And um, I told uh, David that our loss was his gain and he's looking forward to having Brenda join his team over at the Smithsonian. We really appreciate everything that Brenda has done over these last several years. Sorry to see her go. But <clears throat> the way I look at things is we now have a friend, we have another friend at the Smithsonian. Um, so congratulations to Brenda. And Marshall Taylor, who's here, uh, and Marshall has been serving as the deputy uh, at Human Resources. Uh, Marshall has agreed to step up and serve as our interim chief human resources officer uh, as Brenda leaves. And so we really appreciate Marshall, you taking that on um, for this interim period. Um, in terms of the agenda, as I mentioned, I'm gonna start in a second with a quick update on the work we've been doing on deferred action on childhood arrivals. You probably have read about a lot of this in the newspapers. Uh, and I'll, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the things we've been doing at Georgetown, uh, really for, for many years, but particularly in the last year. Um, after I do that, uh, Marjorie Borsico, 
who's here, and Marshall Taylor, uh, are going to walk through um, our new hire calendar, which is a business process effort to help streamline and enhance the employee onboarding experience uh, for new hires and hiring managers. Uh, after Marjorie and Marshall, we'll wec welcome Jeanette Hannah Ruiz, who is here, who is our Deputy Chief Information Officer, and she's going to walk through several UIS updates, GU360, our Verizon partnership, um, cybersecurity best practices, which is something I know we're all concerned about a lot these days, and uh, an upcoming hackathon that UIS is sponsoring. We'll conclude with an update from Robin Morey, who's our Vice President of Planning and Facilities Management. Robin's going to be talking about upcoming campus projects uh, for this coming year, 2018, uh, to include impacts from MedStar and hospital-related construction at the north part of the campus. Um, so that's our agenda. What we're, what we're hoping to do is kind of move through all of those, and then at the end, we'll have time for questions and answers. So we'll kind of hold questions to that point, uh, if that makes sense. And you can bring up questions on the presentations. You can bring up questions on other issues, whatever you'd like to talk about. Um, when we get into that mode, and I'll remind everybody when we get there, we'll, we'll ask you to come up and, and we'll, we'll, I think we have microphones, you know, to make sure everybody can hear. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we can have our presenter, whoever's getting the question can repeat the question, make sure everybody hears it, uh, as, particularly for the people who are joining us via Zoom. If you're joining us via Zoom, you can submit your question in the Q&A portal, and then I'll ask Mike Ingrisano to just read that aloud for everybody here. Um, so that's how we'll proceed. Um, let me start and talk a little bit about DACA. Again, something you've probably read about, heard about, you may have, uh, uh, you may know people, you may, be, you may have a lot of experience with this. Uh, DACA is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. This is a program that was put in place by the Obama administration in 2012. Uh, basically, the population that DACA was targeting were people who were brought to the United States as children from other countries. Um, through no agency of their own, their parents or family members brought them across the border into the United States. Technically, they, are, they came into the country illegally. Um, their children, they have grown up in this country. This, in many ways, is the only country they've ever really known. They serve in our military. They go to our schools. They're active in our communities. And the intent of the executive action in 2012 was to provide stability uh, for people who have this status. Um, and the idea was that, you know, if you're getting up every morning and you have no clue, I'm going to school or I might join the military, I have no clue if I might be deported at any moment. Uh, particularly given the fact of how these DACA recipients entered our country, again, as children. Um, and so that has been sort of the law of the land, although it was not, this has been an issue, it was not a law, it's not a law, it was not passed by Congress. It was an executive action during the Obama administration. Um, basically, the Secretary of Homeland Security is the person who kind of promulgated this policy. And it's been how our country has dealt with what are now about 800,000 people who have this DACA status over the last five years. Um, as the new administration came in, just, you know, it's hard to believe it's been, been a year since the presidential election. Um, it was clear as the incoming administration was coming in, some statements they had made on the campaign that DACA was at risk. <clears throat> it wasn't exactly clear what might happen, but it was clear it was at risk. It was also clear that in higher education on this campus, as well as many campuses around this country, we have thousands and thousands of DACA st students, students who have DACA status, as well as other kinds of immigration status. So this has been a big issue for higher education. It's also been a big issue for the military, former Secretary of Defense, um, 
Robert Gates issued a, a statement the other day talking about the importance of DACA to mil our military strength and our military success. Uh, it's been a big issue for police chiefs around uh, the country. Um, their view is our communities are safer, happier, and stronger if the people in our communities get up every morning and are not wondering if they're going to be deported. Uh, and so um, it's a very interesting coalition um, across our country that is very, very pro-DACA. And if you look at public opinion polls, overwhelming majorities of the American people uh, do not want to see um, these young men and women uh, deported. Uh, the administration um, recently announced that they are going to revoke DACA uh, in, by, by March, and President Trump called on Congress to pass a legislative solution. And so we have been doing a lot of work uh, to, to try to make that happen, to do our part to try to make that happen. Um, that's part of what we've been doing, is engaging... Um, our congressional leaders, and particularly those leaders that, that we know, people who are members of Congress who went to Georgetown or have a connection to Georgetown. We're also engaging the other communities I mentioned, the broader higher education community, police chiefs, other advocates, faith leaders, the Catholic Church is very involved, Catholic Charities is very involved in this. Um, we have been supporting various uh, amicus briefs that have been filed in different lawsuits and lending our name and our support to those. Um, some time ago, before this latest policy instability, uh, we established a position of an undocumented student coordinator, Arelis Palacios, some of you may know her. We have recently been able to move her uh, in, into a capacity at Student Affairs where she's able to focus on this full time. And she has been a tremendous resource for our community. Um, we have um, reached a, an MOU and have a, a memorandum of understanding with Catholic Charities that provides legal assistance to the members of our community who are at risk uh, because of their immigration status. Um, we have engaged in public advocacy. Uh, up on the Hill, we held an event here a few weeks ago where President DeJoya interviewed, moderated a conversation that included our students but also uh, included local presidents, uh, President of Montgomery College, George Mason University, and Northern Virginia Community College, three local institutions that have a lot, a large numbers of undocumented and DACA students. Um, so we're doing a lot, and uh, we, we feel it's a very important issue uh, for higher education, for Georgetown, and for, the, for our country. Um, and happy to, when we get back around to the Q&A period, I'll be happy to answer any questions on that, uh, any of that that I just went through. So let me now um, step off and turn it over to Marjorie and Marshall to talk about the new hire calendar. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So for the technologically challenged, Mike was pointing out all the little bells and whistles over here. Um, I'm Marshall Taylor. I am the Associate Vice President of Human Resources. Uh, as, as Joe mentioned, I will be stepping into the interim role as Vice President of Human Resources come December 4th, uh, when after Brenda Malone leaves. Um, we just wanted to schedule or sneak in a little bit of time here, Marjorie and I, just to go through the new hire calendar. Um, Hopefully everyone is at least somewhat familiar with it. It's been in effect for several months now. Um, and I just kind of, we're going to split this kind of brief discussion up as I see it into Marjorie kind of telling you a little bit about the, the where to find this information and uh, the how to kind of look through the, the uh, various requirements of it. And I'm going to kind of set forth just a little bit of, of the why we have it and what it is. So uh, let me... Okay, um, so like I mentioned, we, we 
put this into effect uh, a couple of months back because we have the payroll calendar that works well for making changes in the system and for transfers from one position to another for existing employees or, or salary changes. And it sets forth the schedules on timelines for everything that needs to be done in and out of the system uh, in order to make sure that these individuals are paid on time. Um, that didn't work so well for new hires and we were running into a lot of uh, retro hires and problems with bringing new people on board because of the timelines weren't structured uh, far enough in advance for us to be able to bring new people on board, make sure all their, their paperwork was done, their documentations were done, was done, and that they were properly entered into the system before they came on board. Um, the biggest problem with that was, the, was compliance issues centered around I-9s. So if we were having retro hires, people were coming in, starting work on Monday, but they weren't in the system, for example, until the next Monday, we're already in violation of federal law in terms of uh, completing their I-9s. So we essentially, and I think I can show you this on the next slide, um, we, we impose new deadlines under the new hire calendar for new employees, uh, which basically pushes back the timelines for the documentations and the and entering data on the system uh, by two weeks prior than it, uh, than it was in existence on the payroll calendar. Um, and the benefits of that, like I said, are that now we can have the new employees entered into the system. We know they're there. Their documents are all up to date and they have all their information and then we can trigger the I-9 process. So under the new, we've gone to electronic I-9s um, and that kicked off the end of July. And so now the hiring process is a prerequisite uh, of, the, of the electronic I-9 system. So what happens is we put the new employees into the, into the system, into GMS, and as soon as they're entered, they will get messages. And some of you, if, you've, if you are new hires or if you're managers, you will get, you've seen these messages come through. They come through to the hiring manager, to the HRC, uh, and to the new employee, informing them that they have to complete their I-9s. They'll do their section one I-9s uh, electronically, or electronically, and then they'll come in with their documentations. Um, the I-9s, as you may know, and, and again, this is all the motivation behind the new hire calendar, uh, has to be done within three days, three business days of the hire. So we'll, the electronic systems will now send messages each day until this process is complete. Um, and as, we, as it stands right now, we've implemented the electronic I-9s, like I said, that was back on July 29th, I believe. And it's in effect for all students and all staff uh, and AAP. It will go into effect, we're looking at February as the uh, roll out for the electronic I-9s for faculty. Um, and then at that point, everybody in the university will be required to do their, their I-9s on through the system electronically rather than through the paper method, which we've had some problems in terms of collection and uh, keeping track of all those in the system as well. Um, so the, uh, the electronic I-9, just up here, you can see it up here. The electronic I-9 forms that we're putting through GMS have already, we've already seen increased in terms of compliance. There's track ability so we can actually easily run reports because it's all now in the system. Um, so it just has become more efficient for us to keep track of who has them, who doesn't, when they're, when they're due. Like I mentioned earlier, the time frames, the messaging is all in place. Um, and uh, we, we were able to keep these digital records, whereas before with the paper I-9s, it's, it's, you know, we were scanning them in, it was difficult to track them all. So the, the new hire calendar has, has now set start dates with Monday hires uh, every other Monday for the bi-weekly or bi-monthly paid employees and Monday, the first uh, of the month for the monthly employees. And that has set all this in motion where we're seeing improved compliance, uh, more I-9s being timely submitted. We're lowering our retro hire problem, which was happening in the system, as I said, because of the payroll calendars deadlines weren't consistent with the new hires. So that was the motivation behind it. It seems to be putting in, put in place. Uh, if there's any questions or issues either regarding this discussion today or in regards to the payroll calendar, I do encourage everybody and anybody to contact HR regarding this. And Marjorie can kind of go into the next couple of slides and discuss with you the, the where you can find the information and the calendar itself.
Thank you, Marshall. So the new process should be, and so as, as Marshall said, you know, we've instituted electronic I-9 for staff, AAP, and students, and so that means that the hire has to be completed in GMS before you can do the I-9. So that really boded the reason behind pushing all of the deadlines ahead of the higher start date in order for you to be able to be compliant with the I-9. So where do you go and what do you do? So when you're in the process of hiring a new person, you're probably putting together the offer letter. The offer letter has the start date in the letter. So before you complete this, the offer letter, I suggest you come to gms.georgetown.edu go into the payroll calendar, the new hire calendar is right there underneath the payroll calendar. You can, act, you can look at the dates very easily. And what I would focus on is the date that the hire needs to be completed in GMS, which is the fourth column over. Um, and so figure out what your hire date needs to be based on when you think you can complete the hire in GMS first, then back up and look at the first start date that's applicable to that. Um, that's how I would use the new hire calendar. Um, now, before you create and put your offer letters together for the staff AP and students, make sure that you are in line with this calendar moving forward. And I would use when you think the hire can be completed in GMS as the guideline and go backwards from, from there. And so that's kind of, that's available to everyone. You don't need to have access to GMS to be able to access the new hire calendar or the payroll calendar. It's right there on gms.georgetown.edu. So anyone at the university, whether you're a manager or somebody creating an offer for someone can be able to follow and adhere to the new hire calendar. Um, and if you have any questions, like Marshall said, feel free to contact HR or talk to us at the end of the session. And I believe Jeanette is up going to do the UIS update. Uh, hi, everyone. So uh, we actually have 42 people on Zoom. So it shows that our uh, Zoom system is working and that we can be the mobile workforce that we are. So thank you to the folks in the back who are helping us with that. Um, I'm gonna get this thing going there. I left cybersecurity off because I can basically talk about that from my brain if anyone ever just wants to chat about it on the side. Uh, so I'm gonna jump right into Verizon. Um, the main thing to kind of take away from the slide is we have a very big Verizon project going on for the next five years. Uh, this institution has chosen to make a big investment in upgrading its infrastructure. And the bottom line is when you connect to Saxonet, if you're connected in your office or students are connected um, on the Healy lawn or even as a place like the ASQ, that little outdoor quad there, uh, they're going to experience over the course of the next five years better Wi-Fi. Uh, and that's really exciting. It's going to be happening in essentially all Georgetown buildings. Uh, and we have some buildings that are get done this year, but we also have 17 buildings and 36 buildings in the subsequent year. Uh, I like anecdotes because who doesn't? It's a good news story. It makes you feel good. So it's nice when people write in and say, hey, zero complaints. You know, 200 people were using it or 600 students were on Wi-Fi at the same time in a building like PCS that, that really wasn't possible before. Uh, but I'm also an outcome-based performance person, so I like metrics. And so these metrics really, to me, tell the full story here, which is you have, you can see these up here, like 19 and 18, like slow speeds. And then you see over here, after we did the upgrade in the summer to PCS, I mean, huge, huge speeds um, that can allow people to actually have 200 or 600 people on a system at any given time. So that's really exciting. If you're wondering where the investment is, that's exactly where the investment is. There's the black and white of it. Uh, you can actually see, I, I'm, I should have asked you guys, oh, you see these little squares up here, um, right by these lights, some of you may see them there in the back. Those things are called uh, APs, for those of you who learned something today, access points, wireless access points. Uh, in PCS, for example, there were 89 of those, and now there are 155, and that's how you get to speeds like that. Uh, on this chart, I really just wanted to show you, here's the buildings that we're uh, going to be going into for the first year. Uh, we did complete PCS basically with a few things that we're uh, finishing up and ASQ. Um, we're holding off on Harris because uh, we're working with facilities and the university, but we want to kind of have a seamless experience for the people who are in there now, but we don't want to make a large investment um, if the university is making other kind of facilities wise decisions. Uh, we want to try to use our capital dollars wisely. Uh, but we'll be coming into ICC. We're being very thoughtful and careful because of the 
mixed use uh, ability of this building to have classes and um, offices and whatnot. Uh, but exciting that we'll get some of these other buildings done this year. Uh, I also want to just touch on GU360 quickly. Some of you may have already experienced a little bit of GU360. Bottom line with GU360 is the university really wanted to move to a much more seamless uh, user experience for pretty much anyone who's interfacing with the university, from the student to the staff to the faculty to when the student graduates and you become a donor, um, and even with a vision towards the alumni uh, later. And the idea is we have a lot of these old legacy applications, I won't go through all of them, but like Gambit and some of these other ones that we want to try to modernize. You know, we work in IT and we're in a very agile kind of state in our kind of technological evolution in the world and in this country. So staying on legacy systems doesn't allow us to be as agile as we need to be. We really wanna personalize things for people. We wanna understand who the different constituencies are, both from students and alumni and parents and donors and people who are doing research and people who are in the medical organizations and external people who are coming in and looking at websites and trying to have that all be one seamless way of looking at Georgetown, one seamless experience and focus on what, what they're looking for versus kind of disparate information and having to go to different systems and different logins. Um, in some cases, there may be some of the same backend systems, but the user interface is the same. So think of it like Amazon. Amazon is always making changes. Uh, they're updating all the time. They're giving you better access. But that user interface, what you see, what they're recommending to you, where you go pay, uh, that's pretty much all the same, right? Because you become comfortable with it. They're not going to make major changes to that. So we're trying to get to that place. Um, this slide really just talks about uh, the value, right? So there's one thing to having a seamless experience, but then there's a value that comes with that, right? Um, the communities are able to get to information um, more quickly. They're able to find it. Uh, you're able to have better data to make better informed decisions about where you're spending either your time or putting resources or spending money. Uh, and then on this slide, it's really then becomes really about how you're getting that information and, and, and growing with this system so that you as a user are experiencing it in a different way. Um, and not, as I said, in all these disparate pieces. Ideally, right, it will become easier for you to navigate and easier for you to find things as we go along here. And then uh, finally, it's for all of us, no matter what our uh, interaction with Georgetown is, st staff, faculty, students, to really have that lifelong life cycle with Georgetown. Uh, if you are having issues, there's still kinks in the system, right? We have just rolled out some of the more recent pieces and, and as early as last week and this week. Um, so we ask you to have a little patience with us. Uh, but also if you are experiencing issues and you feel like, hey, this doesn't look right or I want to give some feedback, um, I would ask you to just uh, send us a quick email at GU360HELP and we can incorporate your feedbacks because we really see ourselves as a kind of continuous improvement, continuous learning environment. That's what this system is supposed to be. It's supposed to be responsive. So we look forward to you emailing us at GU360 uh, help uh, to get your comments. Uh, the last thing before I talk about cybersecurity that I wanna to talk to you about is the upcoming hackathon uh, in 2018, uh, January 26th through 28th. It starts on a Friday night. For those of you who don't have much to do on Friday nights, you too could participate in this. Um, it's, uh, we're basically going to have the whole first floor of the Healy Family Student Center. Uh, anyone actually uh, who is at any university can participate and all you have to do is uh, be over 18 years old. Uh, we have interesting sponsors already. We've started to get some of the sponsorship letters back uh, from people like Google and Verizon and even Craig from Craigslist. Uh, so we're excited about the type of participation we're getting. Uh, we're looking for judges and for um, people to volunteer. Uh, there's judges and winners for every track and there's multiple tracks. Um, one example they gave me was like the entrepreneur track or the gender equality track. Uh, and we have prizes. So example of prizes last year was like $1,000 cash. So if any of you have like students or family uh, who are on campus, it's like $1,000. That could be like something good in my pockets after the new year. Uh, and also like a fire tablet, so practical things that people can use. Uh, the other thing on Hoya Hacks that I would just uh, remind you of that applications are now open. Uh, so you can actually go to hoyahacks.com and submit an application there or encourage if you have young people in your lives who are over 18 
uh, to participate in this. And uh, as I said, we are looking for staff um, to help us and to volunteer or to judge some of these tracks. So uh, if you can uh, participate and help us in any way, um, you can feel free to reach out to me, JH2071, because uh, I wasn't quick enough to do my name, and uh, or the Hoya Hacks, you can email us through that website also. Uh, so the last thing, but um, put that there for the, my friend Robin to come on. I just wanted to spend uh, a, a minute talking about cybersecurity. There's nothing for you to look at, so you can't be distracted by anything up there. Uh, really, there's three things I want to talk about. One is you may have seen um, an urgent email go out just now from the office of the CIO about a Wi-Fi outage. Uh, this is going to happen tonight, essentially starting at midnight uh, through about 4 a.m. Most people won't be impacted by this, uh, but uh, it, if you are on campus or you have people who are working or you have people in the dorms or people are going to be in your offices, uh, hard line connections, so from the wall, are still going to be available. The reason we're doing this is because there was a vulnerability that was identified about two or three weeks ago. You may have seen it in the news called the crack vulnerability, K-A-R-C-K, -K, and um, they just came out with a fix now. And so we've tested that fix, and it's imperative that we get it out and do it in a timely fashion. Uh, so we're trying to do it at a time when we inconvenience the least amount of people. Uh, so I wanted to make sure people knew about that. Number two is uh, Joe Lee, our Chief Information Security Officer, uh, just had October Cybersecurity Month. October was National Cybersecurity Month. And one of the things that we're uh, encouraging all staff and students to do, we have the licenses now, is to sign up for Duo. If you go to the UIS page within um, the GU website, you can see a button for Duo. Duo is two-factor authentication. It's an added layer of security and protection for you. And it's something that people may see as a small inconvenience, but think of it like the keys to your door you, or your house. You would never leave your house door open unless you live like out somewhere where I don't live. <laughs> you would always have your keys with you. And so Duo, think of that as your keys. Uh, it basically, when you're trying to log into GMS or any other application, it will send you a notice to your phone. It will not allow you to get into that application unless you click something on your phone that basically is a big check in green that says, yes, it's actually me and I'm trying to get into this application. So it's something that's very helpful. It's something that the university is investing in um, for an added layer of security for all of us. So uh, we're really trying to talk to more people about that. Uh, the last thing is we're coming into the holidays and our chief information security officer is going to be sending out um, some information in campus-wide emails, both with um, the Thanksgiving holiday coming up and then the December holidays. It's just an added time where you're going to be using more of your credit cards. There's a lot more transactions happening. And this is a time of heightened financial crime, but also a heightened time for cybersecurity crime. A lot of people may be at their desk ordering things or on your phone, and it's a time when we want to say to people, here are some basic hygiene practices we want you to keep in mind. So please be on the lookout for those, and please disseminate, help us disseminate those within your offices so that as we come into those holidays, we have some you know, two, three, four key things that they're important for us to keep in mind as we're making these transactions. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Robin Mori, Planning Facilities Management. Thanks for giving me a little bit of time to give everybody an update on the construction around campus that you'll be seeing uh, in the very near term and in, in the not too distant future as well when we talk about MedStar. <laughs> so the first one is Cooper Field. Uh, that project was authorized by the board in October and we're going to begin construction sometime in uh, December is likely. Um, and the scope of that project really is to provide uh, stadium seating, uh, a building that provides game day locker rooms, game day restrooms, game day concessions uh, versus what we have there now. Additionally, it's going to uh, uh, really build on our theme of the campus plan, which is the student life corridor with an anchor to the south at the Healy Family Student Center going up Tondorf Road. As you walk that path now, the east side of the field, which on this map is right here, it's really a fence and bleachers, not, not that attractive. This will improve that landscape. It will also improve the landscape in front of um, Regents and then also in front of the McDonough School of Business in Hariri. Uh, 
making all that truly ADA accessible and get rid of that old construction pavement and get true walkable paths and, and, and so forth. So improving that, improving some of the um, sustainability features like a, an allay of trees on Tondorf Road that you see here, as well as a grove of trees on the north and the east side of the field. So that project begins in December, as I said. Um, just some elevations to look at, some pretty pictures. So this is if I am standing with my back to the west on um, West Road, looking at the building. This is on the field looking at the building. So you see the, the stadium seating as it goes up, press boxes and so forth. Let's see, that's a south elevation. So um, my back facing the south. It's where you will enter the space. So the plaza, on, and this would be on the, the south and west corner of the field now, basically at the intersection of North Road and West Road. See what that begins to look like, um, really extending some of the fencing around and, and improving it from chain link to actual uh, nice aluminum fencing. And then as you sit up in the, uh, the, the stands, you'll see a much better experience. Uh, we're doing some work on the north side of the field um, that, that begins to put a green screen on the existing wall, add some trees to that experience, cuts a little bit of that hill down, and that could actually be used as seating, um, trying to open up that as well for uh, other experiences versus just a game day experience. And there's what it looks like from a helicopter shot. You see it's um, some of the things we're particularly excited about is improving this connection here, adding that, improving the landscape that's in pretty poor condition now. And then you see how the field um, on the north end zone also begins to get improved. So uh, generous gift by Mr. Peter Cooper. We appreciate that. And uh, construction will last approximately um, 12 months, so we're anticipating getting started in December, could, could be January when the, uh, all the final permittings come through, and then that's about a year construction. There will be very little impact to, to most folks that they would see. The field remains in play during the entire duration, and um, there's no road closures. You know, there may be intermittent road closures, but no, nothing of any significant impact. Now, the big project uh, that I want to talk about is the MedStar uh, Medical and Surgical Pavilion. You may know that the university and MedStar over the past several years have been working very hard to try to deepen and strengthen the, the clinical partnership uh, between the two organizations. And as a result of a zoning hearing that happened back in uh, the summer, June 8th, I believe it was, um, the, this project was approved by the Zoning Commission. It was included in our campus plan. And as a result of that approval, uh, the, the agreement between MedStar and the university was, um, uh, if you will, signed and, and sealed and delivered. Um, so that does many things for the university. And what we want to talk about here today, it authorizes the construction of this surgical pavilion. So it's a large building that's going to consume the majority of what is now lot A, the parking lot between the hospital and the um, Darnell, Epicurean, St. Mary's. And we'll have some photos to see what that looks like. Um, from MedStar's perspective, uh, these slides were prepared by them, so uh, I hope I do them justice for the MedStar team, but it, it really is not as much growth as it is getting their operations right size. So for example, ORs are typically seven, 800 square feet nowadays, and their ORs are in a basement and they're about 400 square feet. So the modern equipment that they have doesn't work, uh, not very productive for their operations uh, that they need for the uh, best healthcare. Private patient room, so it's adding patient room. So right now what happens after an operation, literally they will go in the hallway and they'll put a curtain around the patient. Um, not the best way to treat them and, and, and really give them the best care. So this is really right-sizing the operation for MedStar. So I'm um, gonna provide top-notch, state-of-the-art care for the Georgetown community. So the, the project, as you see, uh, lot A, th this here is the outline of the new building. And again, that's about a half a million square feet. And the current uh, footprint of the parking lot is about right here. So you have Darnell and Upper Curing here and St. Mary's here. So what this project does, it takes all that parking and, and, and traffic and what I like to call mess that's lot A, and it submerges that all underground. 
So cars will immediately come in off of entrance one that you see here. They'll immediately come in, do a little bit of a circle, and then enter the garage. That's that parking lot on the north side of St. Mary's today. They'll immediately go underground. So that, that automatically minimizes the, the pedestrian and the vehicle interfaces that we're trying to minimize on campus uh, over the past few years. Um, and this entrance will now be predominantly used for MedStar patients. So the garage will be under the ground there and it's about three levels that, that it spans this whole area here. So underneath the building itself, underneath this new green space and underneath that new green space. Um, further ambulance will come in this side and come down here all the way down to the end and this is a new OR. If you're uh, dropping off emergency patient, like if, if a member of my family and I was driving them, you would literally come in the same way, come down here, do the drop off here, go back up and then go in a garage. So that's kind of the theory. So there's no, uh, no more uh, in and out there all along the, the east and the west sides of lot A. Georgetown um, staff and faculty, as well as MedStar staff, will primarily use entrance four and come in and use a new road that we're constructing on the north side of the field and then also we're expanding the circle there in front of Lombardi. And you'll see some more photos of that in just a moment. Benefits of this project from a physical perspective, it obviously increases our sustainability initiatives. It really minimizes the pedestrian and vehicle traffic, adds the green space. Those are a series of what we were calling four outdoor rooms. Students have been engaged in the design of the concept of that space. Um, could not be much happier with, the, with the, the way the land use is happening with this particular project. So you see, this is the existing lot A as I was talking about. Here's Darnell, St. Mary's, and now you see what it will look like after the project's done. Here's a, a sky view of it, so that's kind of looking south and to the west. Here's that garage instance I was speaking about. We kept the trees out of this rendering. You got three outdoor rooms, one, two, three, and then really what will be a large park here and then how that connection will come in and out from St. Mary's. It's a view looking to the south and west again, but at ground level. So looking out, there's the new hospital. St. Mary's is over here in, in the foreground. There's that connection coming out there. Reservoir Road here to the bottom right of the screen. It's looking more south. You see the long bar. This is Reservoir Road here, Georgetown Hospital here. Georgetown University here. It also provides an entrance and an identification so you know where you are. If you don't know your, where you are, you don't really know which university and what's hospital. I'm gonna make those improved connections there. This is the, excuse me, this is the schedule as MedStar communicates it today. Um, so I, I think this is still in, in a rough form. They have yet to get permitting and final approvals from the old Georgetown board but notionally they will start with construction by take, uh, doing uh, hazardous materials abatement in Cobra Cogan, and then shortly after that, take that down. And that's supposed to begin in January of 2018. So just a few months, they're gonna start effectively doing the hazardous materials abatement in Cobra Cogan and then take it down. After that, utility relocation, and then they do what we call the big dig, and that's, that, that's this big piece right here. So for, a significant period of time that will be fenced off and they're going to dig three levels of garage and come back up. And um, it's going to be a relatively disruptive project. Um, MedStar will have a website. They will have regular convening meetings about it. Um, you know, they have specific uh, requirements on when they can do their work. Uh, they've come to the agreement with the students that they're actually working later than what DC code permits. So the students have a little bit more quiet time. Um, once the, the actual digging and the sheeting and shoring is done and they, and they pour the levels of the garage, most of the other construction is prefabbed offsite and then brought on site and assembled, if you will. So they're trying to do that to also speed construction and minimize inconvenience to the clients. And then you see down here, so sometimes these are fiscal years and they uh, operate on the same fiscal year we do, which is uh, July through June. And so this would be, what is that? That would be July of 2021 would be right there. And then so they're looking at finishing in January of 2022. So right now they're calling it a four-year project. 
So uh, this is um, just to give you an idea of how that's going to start. So we talked about Cobra Kogan, and then you see that's how they're going to start doing the excavation. And then phase two expands to the rest of that area. Um, again, to orient us on the map, Reservoir Road, existing hospital. This is the construction area, obviously, Darnell and St. Mary's. So that's the hospital project proper. Um, in order for the hospital to do that, there are two what we call enabling projects that we're going to do that will have some impact to the university uh, as well. Uh, one's called East West Road, and that is a, a new road that's constructed connecting entrance four, which is at the, the north and the west portion of campus, connecting it all the way to Lombardi Circle. And at Lombardi Circle, we also expand that circle. The existing retaining wall and the slope cutback wall gets moved further west and then that allows for buses to turn around and eventually have single seat transportation of our guts so you can get on at Roslyn and DuPont and be dropped off at the top of the hill versus using the mini shuttle as we do now. So uh, I should say that the two areas I wanna point out in this will be significant improvements. One is this is the area where the credit union is now and then your space here, which is um, nothing nice, if you will. There's no place, it's just you get from one space to another. So this road here, that um, big slope when you come in there, if you've ever come in that, that gets cut down. Uh, we have to change one of the entrances to the garage and that's a MedStar garage. Road gets widened a bit and then we obviously make this connection. This is a cut back slope hill now, that gets uh, actually a retaining wall and then a road. So this is what that new um, area will look like outside of uh, new research. So just a series of trees and really trying to do some placemaking there as an opportunity as we excavate much of that area and, and do the road. Um, it's also important to note that as we can, um, since we're pretty geographically challenged in many areas, you see this curve and all this does is provide us more longitudinal um, space so we can make it the right slope for ADA accessibility. So right now, the sl some of the slopes is you, you try to navigate past the koi pond and come down to the road and get back up. Not truly accessible because some of the slopes are too high or too low. What you'll see here is as we come off of Lombardi Circle, sidewalks are widened and then we create a nice uh, uh, slope that, that's ADA accessible to be able to get into new research or basic science. Then we go to in front of Lombardi Circle. As I said, this, wa this wall is new, soccer field here new circle here, trying to be more um, precise and specific about sidewalks versus the roadway. Right now, people just kind of walk anyway, so we're trying to be very specific about where pedestrians should go. Longer term, when MedStar relocates some of the Lombardi functions, we will bring buses up here and turn around. Bus stops will be here, a uh, uh, side um, drop off here, where we have the bus shelters and um, single seat transportation from our bus routes to the north side of campus. As I said, this will be the main entrance for Georgetown faculty and staff and MedStar staff. They will come in this side and they will, what's going on here with my thing, there we go. They will come down uh, south and then they'll enter the Levy Garage from, from the west. That's particularly important too because no longer will Levy Garage be utilized by patients who really don't know where they're going. And, that, and many times when uh, patients don't know where they're going, that's what kind of slows and causes some of the traffic jams. So those folks will be permitted by, the, by either MedStar or the university and ease access in and out. And then this uh, will only be accessible typically by um, maintenance vehicles or ambulance or buses. And then um, this area right here is a new backdrop for taxi cabs to be able to sit here in queue until uh, our guests from the hotel come out. The other uh, project that we have, whenever you build new uh, square footage, we've got to provide heating and cooling. So this is a central utility plant expansion. All the other stuff is nice, but this is the fun stuff here. The big old chillers get put in there and they, they, they generate our chilled water. We do get a boiler gets put in there. Um, that's really where the rubber meets the road and allows MedStar to do their work. So. The chiller you see on the top there, that was actually one that was delivered a few years ago 
when we did a chiller plan expansion for Thompson Athletic Center and Arupe Hall. That new square footage required new chilled water capacity. So we're going to be putting in another one of those. And then the bottoms of boiler installation, you see the, the schedule there. Very little impact, if, if at all. You wouldn't even notice it. It all happens indoors. And there's a few resources you can use to find out about the MedStar project and the master planning. Thank you. Okay, thanks to all of our presenters, and uh, we now have some time for questions. Um, and, you know, let me start. Anyone in the room has a question on any of these presentations or any other issues you'd like to raise? We do have a microphone in the back. We got a hand right here, Chris. Hi, I'm Diane Farrell with UIS. And, Robin, this is a question for you. When you redo Cooper Field, right now there's not really a great sidewalk going down next to it. Will you be putting in a new sidewalk on the uh, west, on the west, east side? Uh, yes, we will. So uh, when you say there's not a nice sidewalk, um, so there's really two, two ways it's particularly bad. The road is bad on the west side of the field, right? And then in front of Harbin, that sidewalk is not too pleasant either. We, uh, this project at this point doesn't do anything to the east side, but it does add a nice generous sidewalk on the east side of the field. So yeah, you'll be able to walk. I don't have the photo. I can do that. In, give me two seconds. I can show you. Okay. So yeah, so nothing here on the Harbin side, but yes, there's a sidewalk here that takes you all the way up. And then you see you get your ADA access here. So yes, that is an additional sidewalk, nice and wide. It's not one person squeezed by on both sides. Thanks, Robin. Other questions? Yes, uh, Rosemary. Chris will bring you the uh, microphone. We do have some. My name is Rosemary Kilkenny. This is not really a question. I just wanted to reinforce one of the points that Jeanette made in her presentation representing UIS. Jeanette mentioned that we were going to be having a hackathon in 2018, and we did one last year. And many of you hire students in your respective departments. And I just really wanted to encourage you to, to make sure that your students know about a hackathon. Last year, we had, we had teams from all over the United States. And there were very few Georgetown teams that actually participated, even though we were hosting it. And so we want to see a lot more Georgetown students, and especially women. One of the themes that I personally would like to promote is the theme addressing issues of gender equity and violence against women. We had one team, we actually had four teams last year that did their presentation around gender equity. And it's really exciting, it's very innovative, and we're probably going to be, be counting on many of you to spread the word to your students and encourage them to really participate. And the reason why this is really important for Georgetown is that we have been selected by the United Nations to be one of 10 global universities fighting gender um, violence across the globe, as well as promoting gender equity. And so the UN Women's Office is actually sponsoring a series of hackathons at the various universities that are members of this 10 member um, set of schools. And each of us is being asked to identify students from nine additional schools. And so we wanna make sure that we have a very, very um, significant showing of Georgetown participation, especially focusing once again on the issue of gender equity. And I believe the hackathon's date is set for January 26th. And Jeanette, would you mind letting people know when is the deadline for, for application? Yes, we will. We will be accepting probably the people in this room. Okay. But we, you know, applications are open now, and we're hoping to get most of them in toward the early part of January so we can get the team set up. Rosemary, thank you. Thank you for that. Let me switch. I think we have a, a question on Zoom, so let me switch over to that. If Mike can read it for us. Yeah, we have a question um, relating to the I-9 verification process. Um, so uh, the I-9 verification emails seem to be sent even after the final I-9 verification is completed. Is there a way to stop them 
when the verification is done so the time isn't wasted following up. Marshall or Marjorie, I don't know which one of you wants to take that. Here's a microphone coming. So whoever wrote that question, if they could email me the example so that I can understand the timing, the, um, and Tia has a question. Okay, here. Hey, Bridget, Tia Freeman Evans from HR is gonna address this. Sure, if the uh, I-9 alert is still coming after the I-9 has been completed, you can email um, I-9 at georgetown.edu and we'll look into it and we'll make sure that the business process is canceled. Okay, thank you very much. Anything else from Zoom at this point? Any other questions in the room here? Okay. I think that brings us to conclusion and uh, want to thank everyone. Again, thanks to our leadership of the Staff AAP Council for making this possible and all the work you do. Congratulations to the new officers that we welcomed and recognized at the beginning and thanks to everybody for being here. Thank you.